friends. Welcome back again to this midweek study of the parables of our Lord. Uh, there are two, as far as we are concerned, two main categories as far as simplicity is concerned of the parables. One is a complete story that the Lord tells with a heavenly meaning, spiritual meaning, as well as an earthly meaning. The other is a simple uh, sentence and sometimes only a word. And so the passage that we're going to study tonight is going to open our eyes <clears throat> to those more simple parables. This is brought to you by the Anglican Orthodox Communion Worldwide. My name is Jerry Ogles, and I am a minister in that church. Tonight's passage comes from the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. And we'll read that together. Um, <clears throat> and it came to pass that as he went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another said unto him, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Now, the first very simple parable in there is in verse 58. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. A man wanted to follow Jesus. He said he would follow him whithersoever he went. And then Jesus told him this. Why did Jesus tell him that? He told him, if you're going to follow me, you're not going to have a place either to lay your head. You're not going to have a house. You're not going to have the convenience of the rest of the world because the rest of the world searches after riches only. But if you follow me, truly follow me, you will have nothing like that. You put your spiritual work, your dedication and your, uh, your duty to God first in everything, your love for God above all else. That was the simple parable. And he said to another, follow me. And he told the Lord, he said to the Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now that is a very telling passage there. It has ramifications for us today, just as much as it did for those who were listening to Jesus, Jesus at that time. If we, if we look at the book of Romans, chapter 323, we see that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All means everybody, you and me and everyone else. And then in Romans 6.23, we're told for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> wages of sin is death. We all are living in sin from our birth. We inherited that sinful nature from Adam. And so we are, we're technically dead as far as spirituality is concerned. We're walking dead. If you want to call uh, it by a Caribbean term, it would be a zombie. We are walking about in bondage to sin. And we're dead people walking about in bondage to sin. Because the wages of sin is death and we are sinners. There's nothing good that we can do that will earn us the salvation of Christ. It's a gift. It's a gift of grace. In Proverbs 21, 4, we read, and a high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. Think about it. There's nothing sinful about plowing a field. But if you're a sinner, 
Everything you do, good or bad, is sin because you're doing it for the wrong purpose. Now, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. What did he mean by that? Can the dead, physical dead, bury the physical dead? No. But he's saying, let those people who are dead to Christ, those who are dead in trespasses and sin, let them bury the dead. But you, if you follow me, must be different. You are alive. Your spirit has been made alive, quickened, in other words, by the spirit. Ephesians 2.22, I'm sorry, 2, uh, beginning at the second verse says this, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh, and the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversations in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others are. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. Now, what does that mean? We were dead in trespasses and sin before the Holy Spirit quickened us and made us alive. Just as Lazarus was dead in the tomb until he heard the voice call him forth to come out. And he arose and came out. The same thing is true of us in the spirit. We are dead in trespasses and sin until we hear the voice of the Holy Spirit tugging at our heart and drawing us to the mercy seat of God. Now, the mercy seat in the tabernacle was located just above the Ark of the Covenant, which contained the Ten Commandments. And so the Ark of the Covenant represented the Ten Commandments. You must keep these if you are to be saved. However, no one could do that, and God knew it. And before the foundations of the world were laid, he prepared a plan of salvation for us through his only begotten son. And so above that ark, which contained the law, is the mercy seat, the grace. And it is it tops, it trumps the law. That does not mean that if we become Christians, that if we are saved, that we have no obligation to obey the law of God. Indeed, we do. As a matter of fact, we have a greater obligation. However, it's not through the tenets of the law itself. It's through love. Proverbs also tell us that love covereth all sin, and that's true. If we love, we cannot sin against the object of our love. We may make mistakes. We may hurt that object, but we don't do it intentionally. So that grace that is imputed to us, the righteousness that is imputed to us through the shed blood of Jesus Christ wipes our sinful slate clean and we are made whole. When Jesus healed the sick, he most often said, your, sin, your sins are forgiven you. And then he healed whatever malady they had. He took care of the most important illness first. That's the way we should approach Christ with our sins. We have that serious illness. The Holy Spirit is drawing us to Christ. We turn all of those burdens over to him at the mercy seat. Let him take our burdens. Let him take our burden of sin, which he bore on the cross for us, and walk in you in newness of life. And that's what we are in Christ. When we're born again, we're born in you. God bless you. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time.